Unemployed and Afraid acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this episode on and of the land where you, the listener, are tuning in from. We would like to pay our respects to Elders past, present and extend our respect to any First Nations, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today, acknowledging that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid, a podcast that explores the glorious mess of building your own business with the people doing it. I'm your host and fellow business builder, Kim Curtin. Thank you for being here. Let's get into some good, honest small business chat. A big welcome again to Unemployed and Afraid listener, the podcast that brings you the personal stories, real feels and priceless inspo of building a business. The thing about creating and running a business that just gets me right in the gut every time is just how damn personal the whole experience is. And I mean personal in the sense that you're not just creating work and sharing products or ideas, you're creating a whole new version of yourself along the way. All those hair tearing moments along the journey of making a business happen, happen for us as people too, right alongside of it. So if no one else has told you today, you're a goddamn superhero to do what you do and just keep going. It is so worth it. After recording this chat, I'm about to share with you, I had so many personal and professional light bulbs go off that have just been invaluable. My guest is Rayoni Douglas, upholsterer and creator of Culture Kush, and the perfectly honest way she shares her story might just set some light bulbs off for you too. We talk about starting a business before you're ready, identifying where you can do things differently to stand out in your field, the realities of doing what you have to in order to fake it till you make it, managing through the personal challenges a growing business can bring, the high level of expectation and identity attachment we can develop to our business, particularly in creative fields, learning where to draw the line between on the clock and off when working on your business, and simply sometimes asking for what you want. It is an incredible chat and I know you're going to love it. Here she is. I'm here with Rayoni Douglas, the upholsterer behind Upholstery, where she is turning furniture into statement pieces. And she's the creator of the very sexy furniture brand, Culture Kush, which is Australian made to order, mid-century inspired modular furniture that I am absolutely drooling over. Her culture kush pieces are an ode to a time when colours were unafraid to go out of trend. And there was an unwritten rule that if you pay for something, it will do as it's intended. Their modules allow for multiple configurations and a choice between eight delicious durable velvets with Rayoni working hard in the design and making process to use materials with a lower tox status and unbreakable foundations that look, well, basically unreal. I'm clearly a fan. If you give her Instagram a stalk, you will see why. Featured in the design files, Hunter, the Newcastle Herald and more, and loved in fashionable homes everywhere. Rioni is a girl after my own heart and maybe yours too. She's someone who just knew she was meant to be doing her own thing and worked through trial, error and adventure to find it. Rioni, I cannot wait to hear your story of building your two incredible businesses. Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid. Thanks, Kim. It's so great to have you here. I think we've been chatting for half an hour now. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's I could talk to you for ages. (laughs) I'm glad we pressed record so we can get into it and capture all of your incredible story and learnings. I am very obsessed with your brand. But before we get into that, I would love to know, how would your partner Talia describe you? She would call me creative, brave, considered, and probably a little bit sensitive unhinged and emotional. (laughs) I think your partner knows you better than anyone, both sides. I think brave and unhinged comes in like the same actual pocket, like (laughs) they're one and the same. Yeah. (laughs) Can't have one without the other. I feel that. So before your incredible upholstery business, before Culture Kush, who were you? Growing up, I'd always loved making, but sadly I was led to believe that it wasn't a realistic career choice. I don't know what it is about growing up, but you just, you take what adults say so literally. And then when you're a kid that did well in high school, you're just also then led to believe that you should be going to university. So I ended up going and doing a tourism management degree, which is basically a business degree with tourism chucked in, but 
to be honest, it was just one big party for me. I just had the best time. And I couldn't tell you one thing that I learned from the degree really, because it was just a P's get degrees mentality. And if anyone told me at the time, I also had no concept being a middle-class white person, like how much money it actually is to get a degree. I was just flitting along and having a good time. And then after my degree, I ended up getting a a lot of roles actually in customer service and admin, which it wasn't also something that the degree was necessary for, but no job I had was particularly bad, but they left me feeling pretty unfulfilled. And so I basically spend a lot of my time making and creating on weekends or after work. I had a vintage market store where I'd make alterations to clothes and then sell them at markets. I'd make tile mosaics. I'd do crocheting. I'd basically experiment with any craft I hadn't tried. And I'd done a lot of travel here and there and I got into my mid-20s and I just decided after another role that just I wasn't particularly good at either. (laughs) But you just end up in these things just to make money. The degree was so wishy-washy that it wasn't like a very specific thing. And so I ended up just quitting it, quitting a job with nothing else to go to and and just being like, I'm just going to do some things that excite me. And I ended up working part-time for two designers. So one was a swimwear label and one was a clothing label. And they were two women in their late 20s, early 30s who were just running their own businesses. And I was assisting them in retail and production and some like marketing and social media. And I was absolutely loving it. But the money and living in Manly on Sydney's Northern Beaches at the time, it wasn't easy to like scrape my salary together to pay rent. But basically through working for those brands, I realized that at some point I really wanted to start my own thing and but I needed money to do that. And I didn't know what that thing was going to be, but I just knew that I wasn't in the situation I was in. I wasn't going to be able to get anywhere without some flat finance behind me. So I ended up going overseas basically to become a stewardess on super yachts. I I toyed with doing it in my earlier 20s and absolutely loved it. So I just thought, oh, this is a great way to basically save money. Um, You're not spending any money. And what was great is I just put out the feelers for a few people I knew in the industry and I ended up getting a job within a couple of weeks. And that was just that job I ended up landing that was only meant to be for six months turned into a couple of years. And I just had the most fun and it was a it was definitely a work hard, play harder gig where we'd we'd have sixteen hour days, you'd be on your feet all day, you'd be serving the billionaires, millionaires, people with just so much money, like more money than you could ever imagine, but working with just the most incredible team and getting to see like parts of Europe as well. And then basically I just got to a point where I thought, what would it actually look like to finish a job and not be absolutely hating it? Like, how would it feel to leave something on a high note? Previously, every other role, I'd just, I'd ended up hating it so much. Not, I wasn't a particularly like bad employee, but I just would despise going. And I thought, what would it look like to actually leave something on such a high note? So I decided, and that's where I met my partner, Talia, as well, who we were just best friends at the time, which is another whole story within itself of (laughs) vulnerability and love. But we basically, I left that role and moved back to Australia. And I just knew that I had to just start something that was more conducive to my personality and more creative. Upholstery had always been on the bucket list to try, And I was trying to think the other day of how I first came across it. It was, I had a receptionist job for Walt Disney at the head office in London. And basically it was actually quite a boring job. So I just spent my whole time on YouTube listening to music and basically watching people make and create things. And I saw someone working on an 
upholstered chair once and I thought that's cool I'm gonna give that a go one day so when I got back to Australia I just started researching upholstery courses and I found one in Melbourne that I thought oh I'll just go down and give it a go and because all the short courses I saw they weren't enough to really sink your teeth into it all looked a bit too easy like knowing me I just always want to challenge myself that little bit further and I had nothing to lose I had so much like flexibility I had nothing tying me to a place and I went down to Melbourne and tried the course and I just I absolutely loved it like I was that annoying mature age student who follows the teacher around going what is this called and how do I do this and just so enthusiastic about it and so I moved down there and quickly discovered that Melbourne wasn't really for me that sort of bigger city style of living so I ended up getting an apprenticeship down in Torquay and that was an incredible opportunity basically the money's never great being an apprentice but the fact that you can just learn off people at their expense is pretty incredible Um, so I was there for a while and then after doing long distance for a long time with Talia I ended up deciding to move to Newcastle and I'd spoken to a couple of upholsterers up here about doing some work for them because I wasn't quite finished my apprenticeship hours and I just couldn't find the right role. It just became really apparent that you get to a point where you just not happy to be the shit kicker anymore and like the way that you're treated as someone who's still learning is very hard and because I was in Torquay and I didn't really I didn't have any friends really or family I just invested a lot of time on weekends and after work I'd spend a lot of time just like learning the trade and just getting my hands dirty and I'd sell things on marketplace and Gumtree just experimenting. So my mentor at the time when I was an apprentice, I had called him up and I just said, look, I can't find a job that's suitable. What do you think? And he was like, I think you should just start your own thing. Like he was like, you've got the skills, you've done all the hours, they haven't been at work, but you're so invested in this and I don't think you'll ever feel ready. So I took the bull by the horns and did the whole okay, I've just got to fake it till I make it. And I was really lucky at the time we were living with family. So there weren't too many living expenses and Talia was really supportive. So I just, I dived in and initially I kept my costs low. So I was working out of a storage facility, which was, it was hilarious because that's all I could afford. And then what ended up happening was I just got a lot of work through word of mouth, through family and friends. And then everyone who had done work through me, I got them to write a Google review. And I was just doing these things that all my competitors in the area weren't doing. So I also contacted an online publication called Hunter, and they basically do stories on local creatives. And I wanted to look professional and I thought, okay, how can I do this? So actually I hired a space around the corner and made like a fake set of what I wanted my upholstery studio to look like. And it totally didn't even look like that. It just looked like two car garage with like crap everywhere. And so I thought this is my fake it to make it. So they came out, interviewed me and did a story and it really took my business and inquiries to the next level because people then like firstly knew about me but the aesthetic was very different to the middle-aged men that were upholsterers near me basically I found that it became the self-development journey that I didn't ask for (laughs) starting a business I had no idea how hard it would be So I got quite busy and I said yes to everything. And then it really started to exacerbate anxiety. I take medication for anxiety and it just really started to ramp it up to the next level. And the things that would help me there was basically listening to podcasts. So I wish I had a podcast like yours because I felt like a lot of the time I was only listening to a lot of podcasts that were celebrating all the wins rather than just like 
the challenges as well. And also I started seeing a psychologist, which I think anyone who, not just people who struggle day to day, but anyone who starts a business, I think should almost be prepared to have to do that, particularly for people in creative industries. You become so tied to that as your identity that then you place a lot of importance on the work and then people's reactions to the work and you have really high expectations on yourself. And I think because I was also relatively fresh to the trade, there's furniture isn't made all the same. There isn't a cookie cutter approach for everything. So a lot of the time when you're opening something up, there's a can of worms that you haven't accounted for. And I did a bit of research where pricing was involved. So I think I was quite similarly priced to other people in my area, but I was probably taking two or three times as long to actually get the piece out. Yeah, 2020 was an interesting one, I think, for everyone. (laughs) Basically, I thought when the pandemic first happened and there was a bit of a lull, I enjoyed it because it enabled me to take a deep breath And I just thought things had just like totally gotten out of hand. I've just said yes to everything. And then I thought it would quieten down even more, but it just, it ramped up even further. And I thought, wow, this is like now my opportunity where I've got reviews and testimonials and like all the proof. And now I can start having a little bit more of a balance and actually picking and choosing what work I take on and what work I don't. And the other part of my business that I really wanted to see flourish was just rejuvenating all my furniture that I'd collected. So basically that that gave me the opportunity to say yes to customer work that aligned with me and then also have a bit of creativity and fun and be able to choose fabrics and really show people what I could do because there's only so much that you can achieve out of the granny recliner and all the ugly furniture that exists but when you have a trade I think it's really hard when you're service-based to properly niche down because people just see that you can do that thing it doesn't matter that I'm only sharing mid-century furniture or crazy colors or vintage furniture when people see that you can do that thing they just contact you anyway so I had to get really good at saying no and coming up with really creative ways to say no. And that became a lot easier. And then basically in the lead up to Yuri, our daughter being born, who Talia was pregnant with her, it it gave me a new perspective, I think, on what was important once she was born because I didn't want to work past five o'clock. I didn't want to eat lunch at my workbench. I wanted to race home and hang out with her. So it really gave me a new perspective of balance because I think when you get so wrapped wrapped up in those initial years of making something work, you don't do much else. And because my partner Talia was busy building a charity, she was doing the same. So we spent a lot of evenings, like we'd get home from work, we'd make dinner and then we'd work on our projects until 10, 11, 12 at night. We had no kind of handbrake where that was considered. So when we had our daughter, it just became really evident that we needed to bring more balance and basically become ourselves again. (laughs) I can see why she describes you as brave. That is a hell of a journey. I mean, I'm still thinking about the Rayoni selling crochet things and vintage reworked clothes to being on those ships. And also, I, I could ask you a million questions about that just alone because it's giving me below deck vibes and <laughs> I'd love to go into that, but I won't because it's not the tone of this podcast. Probably worse. <laughs> It's exactly what I was hoping for. But seeing all that wealth as well and just like the impact that would have and then walking away from that into something else, like there's just so much bravery there. But 
where I think the bravery has really stood out for me in your story, and you touched on it briefly, but it, it had an effect on me as soon as you started talking about it. I felt tears prickle in my eyes. I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> take a breath. Talking about the impact that having and starting and trying to build your own business has on your sense of self and how you see yourself and how you move in the world and how important it is to have some support, whether it be through a psychologist or another way, a big fan of psychologists, naturally. And the important of addressing that and supporting yourself through it, that's an incredibly brave thing to do as well because I think so many of us use the work as a distraction from how much of a personal undoing business building is. And I just think that is in incredibly brave. It's yeah, an amazing thing to touch on and I'm so grateful that you did. Yeah, it's, it's something that I think not enough people talk about is basically that it's completely tested in that scenario. Perfectionism, how you want to be like seen in the world, how like your upbringing affects things, how, yeah. Oh, I just, I couldn't agree more. I think we are, all of us as business owners, so bloody brave to do this and looking at yourself through that as well is is incredible. As is the, just like a very simple thing that, that I called out from that story, but finding out what your competitors aren't doing and doing that thing. First of all, huge fan of reviews, naturally. My podcast relies on them. But Google reviews as well. It's, Google Maps is where I spend most of my life. It's how I find everything. And <laughs> the reviews on there and how that speaks to your SEO and I had the Google My Business, just like it's such an important part and so worth taking the time to do. How did you even go about identifying what your competitors weren't doing? Was that just a research process? It was easy because in in searching and like looking into them, none of them were female and in my age group and their websites all looked like they were made in the early 2000s. <laughs> I can imagine. So that was an easier standpoint. And I think being a woman too, it was a little bit easier for me to be on that level with people from an interior's perspective. My website communicated that, I was happy to give advice and help with color schemes and it was quite easy to tell what what they weren't because I felt like I was just naturally the opposite of that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense and yeah, testimonials such an important part of building your own business. So you've gotten to that space now when you're having to turn down work to get more aligned. That's, I imagine, a very scary space to be in, an unusual place to navigate. When did you start to consider your own brand in Culture Kush? So I was basically over a few years, I'd been looking for a modular, a vintage modular lounge to repurpose and have for our home. But either I couldn't find the right configuration or the internal bones of the furniture just weren't good enough for me to justify spending thousands and thousands on new foam and fabric. So I toyed with the idea of making some furniture and the more I just tried to find something suitable for our home, I just realized I had to make it myself. And then I ended up as Instagram does, I ended up connecting with some furniture makers who were starting a furniture makers course. And I just thought, oh, that could be interesting. And I'm addicted to learning and I love taking courses and just learning more and more. Like you don't know what you don't know. So when I contacted them and they said, oh, we're actually doing a course soon. You should get involved. And I just thought, oh, it could be fun to use that as an example and just see where it takes me and just try and basically just have fun with something. I ended up doing that course and that was incredible having mentors that was, it was, they were in my, basically it was so linked to my industry, what they do and they stand for sustainability and just making really durable furniture for Australian homes. And so I started doing that course and I just really got involved in the process of figuring out what I wanted before I'd even designed the piece. So I thought for my own home, I wanted it to be durable. I wanted it to be low tox. I wanted it to have a mid-century inspired look. And so I just went with that and it was really exciting to then come up with the brand name because the culture 
part of culture kush was I just wanted it to be ingrained in the brand that you need to have a culture that's conducive to the life that you want to live. So I wanted to be able to do something really well and be able to reproduce that and not have to go with the stress that comes from doing custom piece after custom piece and not knowing exactly how much to price things or how much material I needed or how much time things would take. I could do something that I knew and trying to be careful not to hone in too close to my perfectionist tendencies, <laughs> but make something that I actually knew how much profit I was going to make, how much material and everything to use. That was like the reasoning behind the brand name. And then from there, I just got really involved and really excited in the process. I had to we'd put Yuri to bed and then I'd work on the kind of the background of what I wanted the brand to be and then organizing and doing all the online work with the website and liaising with the branding people and figuring all that side of things out. So there was a lot of time sacrifice, but it felt just exciting because if it failed, it didn't matter because I'd still get a lounge out of it that I really wanted. (laughs) So it was just, there's nothing really to lose here. And I want this, so potentially other people might too. And yeah, I was just going about just having fun with that. And then I was contacted by some previous customers of mine who bought some of my upholstery pieces and they were like, oh, we were wondering if you're working on a lounge at the moment. And I was like, well, actually, yeah, I'm designing a lounge for my own home and I think I'm going to start a brand out of it. I'm like, almost finished the prototype. Like, did you want to just come around and have a look? And and I knew that these customers were quite quite values-based. They're very aligned to what I wanted the brand to be. And they came by and had a test sit on one that was partially done. And they said, yeah, we'll go ahead and we'll buy one. Like, how quickly can you make it for us? We've just bought a home. And do you think you'd be able to turn it around in couple of months and I was like yeah let's do it luckily through the furniture course I'd already figured out pricing so I could just send that off to them and it was really exciting having the idea validated without without having to do anything really they just came to me so that all felt really exciting and then I myself got pregnant so then basically we had the launch photo shoot and I was six weeks pregnant doing that and I think I thought that would take a little longer to happen so it was just then more if I'm doing this like why wait so when I launched the business in December 2022 I was already quite pregnant and I just thought if this is gonna have the kind of culture that I actually want it won't matter that I'm having a baby because It's just got to work with us. (laughs) So then I contacted the design files and I just said, look, this is what I'm doing. Would you be interested in doing a feature on me? I think it's really funny from a PR perspective that a lot of people just think that you've been seeked out or people just stumble across you. But actually, most of the time, it's you putting yourself in front of people and actually being like, this is what I'm doing. And because I think people just thought that, oh, they came across me and they just offered to do a feature on me. But that was very strategic in wanting to be, have just launched and then be on their platform. So I got a lot of really good traction from being featured on there. And that was just like, absolutely like an incredible place to start from. And then I received another couple of orders And then, yeah, since I've received a few more and I think because I didn't put too much pressure or expectation on the whole, on what would happen, it's just felt quite enjoyable and effortless. And because I went through those first hard couple of years, I was like reflecting on it the other day that like doubting yourself is actually just quite boring. Like, why do we do that when you've already proved that you can build something from the ground up and just enjoy the process because like your work is never actually going to be done when you 
run a small business, there's always something to do. I think I might have just found your episode title, Doubting Yourself is actually quite boring. That is like the best line I've ever heard. It gets me right in the gut. It is so true. Like, why do we have to do that? We've proven to ourselves time and time again that we can start something new, start something over. It can be a success in its own pocket. So it's a success to you because you've seen it be real and you've put it out there and you've gone through the process and you've learned and you've grown. That is a success. So stop yeah. doubting ourselves. I love yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. You have to remind yourself that you've done this before and failure is all part of it. It absolutely is. You said something along the lines of when I went to build this, I knew I wanted to be able to like replicate it easier. And I think so many of us get into that space where if you're a service-based business, you do get to that stage where you're like, this is fantastic. I know I can do well in this if I keep going, but how does it actually fit with my life? And how do I actually make this a little bit quicker in terms of replicating? Is it something that I can get it out the first time, have it all be done, and then it takes a quarter of the time for the next, for however long? Or is there something in your mind that you can replicate and put into a course to help others or something that you can monetize so that you get a little bit of that life balance back for yourself to be free to develop the next thing and the next thing? I think that's it's an in- incredibly important thing to remember. And what does it look like to just do, actually just keep it simple and do one thing incredibly well and like foster that slow growth rather than having to launch something with 10 products or look at all these things I can do. What if you could just do this one thing really well? And then of course, like my mind's gone wild with all the other things I can create. But and all the different iterations that I can go from making these modular pieces and how well they're going to like fit into other like people's homes and how I can do like different styles based off the design. But there's no point right now because I just want to focus on one thing at a time. Yeah. And please don't stop doing them anytime soon because I want one. So when I'm ready to replace the furniture I sold. <laughs> So that I could live fully furnished life for a little while and chill. When I'm done with that, let's, I would love to get one. So don't stop anytime soon. And I must say your approach to PR and sending an email saying, this is what I'm doing. Would you like to feature me? Is perhaps some of the most helpful advice I have heard lately, because that overthinking of putting yourself in front of people, it can, I'm a strategist at heart. We were talking about this before. I'm constantly looking for the right tone of things, the right connection point between me putting something out there and the person receiving it, making sure there's a hook, all of these things. You overthink all of these elements about your own brand and your own tone, but it is quite honestly as simple as we can just put things out there and go, here's what I'm doing. Want to do a feature? Here's what I'm doing. You interested in chatting? Here's what I'm doing. Like it doesn't have to be overcomplicated. It doesn't have to be perfect. Yeah. And the worst thing that can happen is they just don't respond or they say no, and no one needs to know that's what happened. The further along I get, I realize that people are also like really happy to help you. Like I probably weekly will write to someone on Instagram that I don't know and be like, Hey, like, I love what you do here. or I adore your work or what software do you use? Or people are really responsive and really want to help because other small businesses know how hard it is. So if they can help you to make that link a bit quicker, People just like helping. (laughs) We underestimate that sometimes. And particularly if you're in an area, I know I feel this a lot where you're working alone a lot of the time and you're working on whatever product you're creating or brand or business that you're building and what goes out into market, but also all the stuff that has to happen behind the scenes. It gets really lonely sometimes and you start to overthink things. Like I've definitely gone through a period of that lately where I'm just churning and overthinking everything and actually not doing anything. (laughs) <laughs> which is like the annoying byproduct of overthinking things. But yeah, just that simplicity of connecting with people and sending off a message to me like, I like what you're doing. And we're all a community at the end of the day and we're never alone in the true sense. It's a constant reminder of that. Totally. And I think people see you differently to how you feel. I just feel like I'm ambling my way through business and life every day and people people have this this idea that, oh, you're just killing it and things come easy to you, but it's just like such a daily struggle. I feel that. I feel that so much. How is it now running your two streams concurrently 
with two children who, as you described earlier, at potential risk of scalping each other at the moment. How are you balancing all of these things? I've been off on maternity leave for the past few months since Bella was born. We'll see how that goes when I become full-time again. It is going to be quite interesting. I think it will be a lot of niching down even more so with a pulse tray and doing not just the jobs that are going to be a little bit more profitable and easier for me to do and that light me up. But as Culture Kush gains a little bit more traction, I think that'll probably naturally, I'll take a little bit more of that on than a pulse tray. But yeah, the juggle is real. That's where my partner and I have had to write a full schedule. of. And luckily for me, her work is quite flexible as well. So we just feel that we're daily just footballing the kids from one of us to the other. And yeah, it's just madness, but it's a good reminder now with the kids of yeah, what's important and what kind of business you actually want to create off the back of that. Like a little bit of hustle is fine and particularly at the start, but it gets to a point where you're just like, there has to be flow and like what comes easier and what feels good. Do you have anything on your dream list, either something you're dying to learn or something you'd love to add in or just a dream list goal for your businesses, both of them, and where they're heading right now? So I'm actually talking on courses. I've just started doing an email marketing course. So I, this is your maternity leave yeah. course? <laughs> In between naps and feeding, yes. <laughs> That's been really exciting. I thought I was a few years off doing that, but basically I sent out quite an easy email about a month ago just saying, hey, guys, don't be a stranger. I'm still here to answer any inquiries. And that easy email led to a $17,000 sale. So I, Wow, amazing. So I just thought I need to invest more time and energy into doing this thing rather than focusing solely on social media for attraction. I need to put a little bit more into that part of my business. And then the other thing is I'd love to at some point start the process to become B Corp certified. And I know that's a really, it's a really far off goal because I know the processes can be quite challenging and there's a lot of things you need to do to become certified, but it's really important for me coming back to culture, basically also not be just producing something for the sake of it to, yeah, to have something that's like benefiting from a sustainability standpoint but also social consciousness. That's so amazing. I had a previous guest who described wanting to become a B Corp and how intense the journey is and lots to consider and just said, I'm an aspiring B Corp right now. And I think that is such a, a great stance to put on it because it feels like you're just doing whatever you can now and working towards it as a big goal. What an incredible goal to have. I think that's absolutely brilliant. Ryan, you have just given me so many light bulb moments today in sharing your story. I have my notebook here next to me and I have just written down so many things that I could talk to you about for hours, but so many things that have triggered for me as a small business owner as well and my own growth. Just do not underestimate the power of what you're creating and how you've shared it today and the impact it can have on other people. I'm just, I'm so grateful you shared it. I've loved every second of it. How can the listener and I support you on these next stages of your journey? I guess if you think you might be keen to take a look at mid-century inspired Australian made <laughs> furniture, give me, give my website a look. And just for anyone in business, really, I love to connect and I want to hear challenges. And I guess if there's anything you think I can help you with or just touch base and also, yeah, like in terms of reviews, review Kim's podcast, review the last small business you went to, whether it was a coffee shop or did you hire the local plumber to help you? <laughs> Everyone needs a review. And I think that's a really nice way of paying it forward. And with our busy lives, we just forget to ask for testimonials and reviews. So if you can do it unprompted, it'd honestly, it'd make their week. So yeah, just do it. <laughs> oh, 
Thank you for including me in that. I get like mushy, mushy feels slash awkward feels for being included in that. Thank you. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And you've got me thinking about the electrician that worked on our house recently. And although I'm in a rental, I'm still going to be reviewing him. So you are absolutely right. Those reviews, we live and die by them. It's we think how we use them as a consumer to, to find the people we want to work with. That's everything to the people on the other side. Thank you. That is an incredible place to leave it. We can absolutely give you that support. I'm going to have the links to your website, to your socials as well in the show notes that the listener can go get around. Honestly, I've said it before. I'll say it again. The pieces are mental good. Like they're just really gorgeous. And so, yeah, I hope that listener, you've enjoyed this chat and will enjoy having a look at those. Rayoni, thank you so much for spending time with me today and for sharing your story. Amazing. Thank you, Kim. Thank you for listening to Unemployed and Afraid, the podcast for small business builders with your host, me, Kim Curtin. If you love it, you can say thanks with a star rating and a review. And of course, join the community on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Find us at Unemployed and Afraid wherever you're hanging out and I'll see you there.